I'm Joey Tedesco, and you're watching Cartoon Palooza. What sucks about discussing the void of creativity that were the Disney sequels is that we gotta talk about their live action remakes, especially the ones from other studios' work. Before they decided to remake their own cartoons into live action, there was a period where Disney was adapting other cartoons and material not owned by them. And boy did most of them suck. While I still believe George of the Jungle was one of the better attempts, the rest I can't say the same. Mr. Magoo, Inspector Gadget, oy vey. It's almost hard to believe we could have added Sailor Moon to that roster. Let me rephrase that because it does sound as stupid as it sounds but that Disney was attempting to adapt Sailor Moon to live action. With today's film, we have a cartoon from the 60s that most kids in my generation didn't even know exist. Unless you happen to see the Super Bowl in 2005 and come across this commercial. There's no need to fear, underdog. Never mind. There's gonna be plenty of room to fear on the Palooza because today, underdog is here. The, the live action one. That really sucks. Our movie begins, and it actually starts off pretty well. We get an introduction from Jason Lee as a main character, some opening exposition using footage from the cartoon, and a cover of the theme song from the Plain White Tees. Okay, so the cover is not nearly as good as the one from Scrubs, but good nonetheless. Speed of light, of lightning, roar of thunder, fighting all who rob or I begin thinking that this movie might not be that bad. Then this lasted a good minute or two before the actual movie begins. We learn that unlike the cartoon, the dog would be our hero is... just a dog. Kind of ironic when your opening shows animals in suits and yet it's supposed to show a world where the animals act just like animals. So a dog becoming a superhero is okay, but you couldn't think the audience would suspend their disbelief for having them act like people? To me, this is where the movie drops the ball. They have an opportunity to do something different and inventive by creating a cartoon world and opting out for that typical Alvin and the Chipmunk setup where we're supposed to believe that <coughs> This is the real world! Our main character is a police dog who's captured by a mad doctor that managed to be one of the best characters in the movie. I say this with confidence that there aren't many great characters to begin with. Back when Peter Dinklage was casted simply as being the substitute Warwick Davis, he plays our movie's villain along with the henchman Kronk. I mean Kronk. My bad. I meant to say Kronk. Damn it! It's Patrick Warburton playing the henchman. What do you expect? The chemistry makes the film work to a certain extent. Like they know they're playing cartoon characters, so why not have some fun with it? The dog is captured and ready to be experimented on. Now, if the visual language was enough to tell you what's going on, don't worry, because Jason Lee will explain in voiceover for the majority of the film. That's me in the uniform. I was raised since I was just a little puppy to fight crime. It's hard to feel destined for greatness when you keep messing up. Oh no, they're gonna blame this on me. Oh well, bon appetit. But destiny's a funny thing. You took away my superpowers and put them in a little blue pill. Seriously, even when the dog begins to talk, his inner monologue never shuts the hell up. Yep, where Sinister had me beat. There was no way I could save both of them. I I'm sorry. Look, do whatever you want to me, just let them go. What's the point of narrating your thoughts when... people can hear your thoughts? You sly dog! You got me monologuing! I can't so when the experiment goes wrong in what starts off as an attempt at getting a good cartoon adaptation, the dog runs away and re-enters your generic family film setup. And because Tim Allen was unavailable to play the standard family dad in these kinds of films, we get Jim Belushi. Look! You bought a dog? Well, no, I didn't buy him. I, uh, I found him on the street. He's cute, isn't he? Whoa! Look at this! This must have come out of the same cookie cutter Jim Belushi came out of! Jim Belushi is what you expect. The plaid shirt, every man attitude, single father, minus the personality of a dimensional character. He even has a son whose motivation seems to come from accidentally dropping pepper in his coffee. Give him a chance. You might even like him. I don't think so. All he does is eat, sleep, and poop. He starts off annoyed that his father brought home a dog and mostly whines and complains. Now, who complains about getting a puppy? That's like complaining that your parents brought presents for your birthday. 
It isn't until the kid realizes the dog can talk and has superpowers does he suddenly act like he's given a crap, for the most part. Even when the dog displays his superpowers, it's actually pretty fun to watch. Especially since it's rare when most superhero movies would resort to making superpowers grounded in reality. Here it seems like the filmmakers had some fun with making the dog fight in the air. Hmm, dog fights. But like I said before, we have to go back to the standard family fair. Continuing with the love interest, he wants to impress a girl I could have sworn was Michelle Trachenberg. I guess is that Disney made copies of her DNA so that they could create the collection of youthful Trachtenberg clones once she got older and more credible. In fact, they've been experimenting with this technology in the late 90s and early 2000s. And then, something went... wrong. The boy and his dog begin to get the idea that he could inspire hope and become a superhero. Here they incorporate elements that they picked up from the show such as his rhyming, uniform, catchphrase, his... love for hot dogs? Didn't remember that from the cartoon. While that's going on, we get the strangest transition from Dinklage as the villain trying to recreate the accident that created Underdog so that he can get his reputation back. Sure, why try to get a grant when you can resort to being evil? At one point when Underdog starts to take a bite out of crime, gaining fame and recognition, Dinklage gets a sample of DNA to extract his power into those iconic blue pills that totally defeat the purpose of what they were used for originally. Regardless, the dog's powers are taken away and Dinklage sets up a bomb that will cause everybody to fall under his control. Now remember, this was years before we were under his control as the character Tyrion Lannister. The dog takes the blue pill and gets his powers back in order to stop the villain. It makes you wonder how differently this movie would have ended if he took the red pill. So that's Underdog, and unlike its namesake, it really isn't an Underdog. While the cartoon isn't the worst Disney adaptation they've made, it reeks of uninspired family fare. What could have been a fun genre bender in the tone of Big Hero 6 takes the cheaper, unmotivated route towards making these kind of films. It doesn't say much when the director's filmography includes films like Racing Stripes. At times the effects are nice, and it's always a joy to see Peter Dinklage and Patrick Warburton collaborate, but the magnificence is sucked away by the black hole of entertainment known as Jim Belushi. If this movie would have been animated and allowed the characters to flourish in their own medium, it would have been a slight improvement to an okay rating. However, as it is, it gets an unsurprising forget about it. So my question for today, since we got all these cartoon adaptations coming out of Disney, is what are the ones they should keep making and what are the ones they shouldn't? Because on one hand, you got some good cartoon adaptations, on the other, you really don't. So yeah, I'm giving you a two-parter, so I'm giving you a little bit of a homework on this one. Now, I'm Joey Tedesco, and thanks for watching this review on the Cartoon Palooza.